Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, we are going to keep exploring this idea of liquefaction and some of the the different methods and means for, for identifying, and in this particular video, calculating liquefaction and, and when it's kind of necessary. Um, so we're gonna get a little bit technical. I do have my notes over on the side, that happens. Um, the biggest thing for liquefaction as far as calculating it out, uh, the method that is most commonly accepted. Now, again, we'd mentioned that, that this is kind of not really a new process, just something that's constantly undergoing uh, uh, changes. Uh, one of the most widely used uh, equations for calculating out the liquefiable soils conditions is called the simplified method. Right? So you have the simplified method for calculating, which, um, I mean, for, for, for people who are a little less technical, it's not super simple, um, but, but everything's explainable, right? So this is kind of fun, kind of cool. I like it. It's my thing, uh, but it's something I definitely wanted to explore, both this and, once again, when you want to start looking at uh, uh, liquefiable soils conditions, what that kind of looks like. Um, so you have the simplified method, which is one of the most most commonly used uh, methods for calculating out liquefiable soils. But <laughs> even at that, there's so, so, so many deviations to, to how you do this. And there's a lot of different accepted ways, right? So the reason why I like using the simplified method or why this is the one that I'm explaining is because there was a research paper done by the, <sighs> forgot the group. Apologies. There was a research paper done, so I'm taking a look at uh, the, this research paper and kind of pulling a lot of the information off of that. And they talked a lot about this method and where some of those deviations exist, so that's why I wanted to share that with you today. Uh, so the simplified method, uh, let's just do... Simplified method is FS, your factor of safety, is equal... Yeah, my bad. Factor of safety is equal to your cyclic resistance ratio divided by your cyclic uh, shear ratio. So we're going to break this whole thing down and it's going to get a lot bigger, but uh, this is the ultimate equation. This is what it looks like. There's a lot of adjustments to it. We're going to go into those in just a second, but factor of safety, uh, FOS equals, uh, yeah, let's do that. Factor of safety is equal to your cyclic resistance ratio divided by your cyclic shear ratio. So that is kind of what this whole whole equation looks like, but really it's like, what is all of that, right? So first, we're gonna, what we're going to go into is, um, well, first of all, the cyclic shear ratio. It's a measure of the earthquake loading or the cyclic shear stress that's induced into the soil, right? And then the cyclic resistance ratio is actually the soil resistance. So the CSR is the first one that we're actually going to go into. It utilizes Newton's second law, and what it does is it creates a representative value as opposed to conducting like a detailed site analysis, right? So how do you come up with the CSR? Cyclic shear ratio. So how do you come up with the CSR? Sorry, we're in it. So the CSR, uh, yeah, let's do that too. Cyclic shear ratio. How? All right, so how do we get that? So your CSR is equal to 0 0.65, this is probably way too big, times PGA over G <sighs> times V over QVO times RD. Yep, that's too big. Sorry. Let's do this backwards. 0 0.65 times PGA over G times V over 
VO times RD. Boom. Yep. Sorry. So, your PGA, or sorry, your C <laughs> CSR, my bad, cyclic shear ratios, 0 0.65 times, I'm on the wrong color, your peak ground acceleration divided by your acceleration of gravity. Then you're going to get this uh, symbol here with V, symbol here with VO. Those are very similar, okay? The first one that you're going to do is your uh, initial vertical stress, and then your initial over your initial effective vertical stress okay and then rd is so rd is is a little different it's kind of a uh, it's a factor for the non-rigid uh, response of the soil column so you're going to get this based off of some of your uh, so factor so factor for non-rigid non-rigid response of soil column. So you need to use your soils testing in order to get this one here, okay? So this is where uh, the difference between SPT and CPT, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, changes a lot, right? So this is one of those areas that, that you're kind of worried about. So your cyclic shear stress is 0 0.65 times peak ground acceleration over the acceleration of gravity <laughs> times your initial vertical stress over your initial effective vertical stress times the factor for non-rigid response of the soil column. Oh, so this is getting, this is getting fun, right? <laughs> this is kind of why I like doing this. So the big thing about the CSR though is that it's actually corrected by a magnitude scaling factor. So we've got this equation. Go ahead and write that down. And then you're going to take the magnitude of what you're worried about, right? And you're going to scale accordingly. So you're going to have your CSR generally represented by what we're going to call a 7.5 earthquake. Okay, down at the bottom is equal to 1 over your magnitude uh, scaling factor times your CSR. Like so. Okay, so this is how you start calculating in the magnitude of the earthquake that you're looking to resist when you're trying to find a factor of safety in the soil in order to find out whether or not it's going to resist all of the movement of everything that you have going on. So CSR, you have the first equation, then you know it's going to be modified by the uh, MSF. We're going to call it that because I'm tired of saying magnitude <laughs> scaling factor. So over your MSF, okay? Uh, that is your CSR. So when we get to the actual equation, it's going to incorporate all of that information. It's the same thing once again for a 7.5 earthquake. Then. We're going to jump into the part that is cyclic resistance ratio and how we get that, right? So your cyclic resistance ratio is original was when you when uh, when this was like super commonly done or or when people were traditionally using the uh, simplified method, then they were using an SPT to find the in situ soils resistance. Okay, and that's still a really really effective way to do that. We've just graduated to a whole bunch of different forms uh, of testing, right? And, and this isn't even getting into the testing where we start talking about like blast testing or laboratory testing or shake table testing, or a whole bunch of other crap that's going on that's really, really cool, but not a part of like this calculating equation thing, right? So newer forms of, the, of uh, dealing with this equation or creating your CRR, sorry, SPT for in situ soil resistance. Okay, so boom. Uh, otherwise we can do the CPT. Now, when you do a CPT in order to find out the information for, for your CRR, uh, what you're looking for is the resistance of your CPT and then shear wave velocity is uh, also a thing. So you're looking for the resistance for, you know, in situ soil resistance. 
and shear wave velocity. So these are all different ways that you can kind of like plug things into your CRR in order to figure out what the rest of this equation is going to look like. And then you're going to come back and you combine absolutely everything. I'm going to have to write small, so I'm hoping you guys can see this as we go. So this is the first time I screwed up so badly I had to make an edit on one of these videos. My bad. So we're going to get into the long equation of your simplified method, right? So it's a very big equation. Uh, it's part of where I went wrong on, 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 you know, the editing. My bad, but I'm gonna walk you guys through the entire equation. So we're gonna have S equals your D T R R. sorry. DRR 7.5 times Omega times K alpha times magnitude vector. Okay, I am putting that in parentheses. So again, my apologies. Sorry. Um, we are going to walk through this. You're going to have your factor of safety. Of safety is equal to your cyclic resistance ratio, you're emulating the 7.5 earthquake, right? So you're going to have this here with the magnitude scaling factor that you're going to deal with over there. So you're going to have your, your, your K with your omega symbol, and this omega symbol is the correction of overburden <coughs> for anything that is not equal to uh, 96 kilopascals. K -T -A. Which I think is roughly, um, nah, yeah, uh, about one ton per square foot, roughly. Okay, so 96 kilopascals. So where we get this is that uh, used in most cases where you have um, no initial static stress or, or any effective overburden or, or, or anything like that, you, you use 96 kilopascals, sorry, for the eff uh, effective overburden. And so another one of those things that kind of gets called into question or not called into question, that differs when different people utilize this method is going to be whatever this this correction ends up being, right? That's one of the areas. We're gonna cover that in a second though. So you got that, you're gonna have Ka, your little K omega here is that, your K alpha here is gonna be your uh, initial static shear stress. Static shear stress on a horizontal plane. Yes, and then you're gonna multiply all of that by your magnitude Scaling factor. Beautiful. So you've got FS equals CRR 7.5 times K omega times K alpha times MSF. Guess what? That's only half of it. That is our CRR, right? So all of this is going to be divided by your CSR. But remember the equation that we already covered. You've got 0 0.65. You start with that times... PGA over G, right? Yeah, that's right. Times OV over OVO, right? Times what was it? RD. Now, if you'll remember from when we were talking about calculating out your CSR, you've got 0 0.65, which is kind of what you start with. Then you've got that multiplied by your peak ground acceleration, right, over your acceleration of gravity, right, and then your uh, omega v was your, uh, omega v was your initial vertical stress, initial vertical stress, and then your uh, omega v o was your initial effective vertical stress, initial effective vertical stress. I'm so out of room. I hope you guys can see all this. I'm writing a lot and it's like 
really, really tiny. So sorry. <laughs> anyway, and the last one was RD, which was the, uh, uh, what, factor for non-rigid response of soil column. Boom. So you have all of the representations. You have how this actually looks as far as the actual equation goes. This is your simplified method, one of the most common ways that people use to calculate out the factor of safety and what needs to be done in order to save lives with viable soils and all of that fun jazz. But on top of that, I told you that in this research report, they're discussing a lot of the variances, right, that are done. Uh, first of all, whether it's CPT or SPT or whatever else, there's also different variations to the actual um, equation itself. So, what areas are most commonly divided by, not this, there, factor safety, accidentally got rid of that, yes. Yes, okay, we're there. Um, so what areas are, are are sort of the areas that things kind of kind of get changed out on? First of all, the relationship between the stiffness of the soil column, right, or the non-rigid response, and the evaluation of the CPT or SPT data, which may become um, 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 a little bit different based off the methods that you use, right? Um, also, these two guys right here, very, very commonly, uh, uh, changed or, or argued about, about, what am I it, it's <laughs> not argued. I'm not trying to find the right word. It's just a different evaluation method, right? It's something that used differently. They're not always going to be the same values. Uh, it, it's just people, people make modifications based off of what they see is right, based off the soils testing, based off of absolutely everything that you have in there. So that's the equation. These are the areas that's different. I don't think that changes. No, that's constant. No, that's constant. I think these change a little bit as well. Sorry, uh, that's just an I think. It's my bad. Um, in any case, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is when would you start looking at evaluating liquefiable soils conditions? So let's say you're on site, you're doing some soils testing, and anytime you have a clay layer of soil, right, that's underlain, and we'll call this bedrock down here. We'll call this a sand, we'll call it a silt, we'll call it, call it something else that's rather porous, right? And then your particles down at the bottom are super tight, right? This is the matrix. Now, if you guys saw the other video I was talking about liquefaction, you should remember something very similar to this with my really crappy drawing, all right? And then, So what we're looking at here, right? You got like bedrock or we'll call it confidence strata down at the bottom, right? You've got a solid layer of clay up here at the top. Then you have right here, I probably should have different, did a different color. Right here, you have pretty consolidated, compacted skeleton structure of the soils uh, particles that are down here at the bottom, right? Uh, silty sand, sand, something porous, right? So you know that the pore water pressure here is uh, fairly evenly dis evenly distributed and isn't doing anything kind of crazy, right? And then you still have the same soil type here, right? But it's very loose, very loose sand, so super porous, right? So the idea, not the idea, but the conditions with which liquefaction can occur or liquefaction triggering might happen is once that ground acceleration happens, you have shaking of uh, uh, of the soil, if you remember the, the, the diagram that I drew last time, all of this shakes, the pore water, uh, pore water pressure increases and it forces the water up, right? Water goes up, all of this loose water goes up. If you've got especially like a channel with which the water can all dispel out the top, that's where you start seeing like the mud, water and all that stuff rise up to the surface, right? But all of these soil particles, what they're going to end up doing, boom, 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 you still have your clay soil, right? And you still have good soil down here at the bottom. Uh, once, once the shaking stops and everything happens, water is dispelled, oops, water is dispelled out the top here. So what you end up with is 
more good soil down here but then all of these particles that were up in the air come down to here now they look like good soil particles right but all of this water that was in the soil that was loose so you need a high moisture content high water table something like that in granular loose sandy porous soils and then all of this water now is what's supporting what's on top but nothing's on or nothing's supporting that right it's like a huge void space there that's create what creates the collapse, especially if you have downward loading of buildings or structures or anything else like that. Why this also becomes an issue is that if you've got like a sewer running through, right, and the ground shakes and this breaks and a bunch of water comes out and the earthquake is still happening, like an aftershock happens. That's what happened a lot of in the uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. That first earthquake hit and it created tons and tons and tons of damage but also sewage, uh, sewer lines were disconnected, water lines broke, and then all of this water was introduced into the soil, into these sandy, porous soils, and the next earthquake happened, right? And all of that water just shook up, and it was just, it, it was a super liquefiable condition, it's something that was really unfortunate, but that's what happened. So anytime you guys are doing soils testing, and you find conditions that look very similar to this, you need to start asking that liquefaction question. Uh, maybe doing a settlement analysis, a liquefiable soil analysis, use that simplified method or whatever else uh, in order to calculate everything out and figure out whether it needs mitigative technique or not. So uh, we are going to go into some mitigative techniques next time and then we still have a whole bunch of testing discussions we have to have. Thanks for your time. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, aside from the fact that I totally apologize for screwing up so badly, <laughs> please drop a comment below or message me privately, and please like, subscribe, and share with everyone in order to do that thing, in order to introduce an online presence. Thanks so much, you guys have a wonderful day.